This is Australia. Okay, wait a minute. This needs to be corrected. And so, this is Australia, a distant country that is fraught with a lot of dangers. Indeed, on this isolated continent, you can run into many potentially dangerous creatures. Poisonous snakes, spiders, jellyfish, sharks, crocodiles, and even a stinging tree, contact with which causes severe burns, and many other dangerous animals. But in reality, the statistics of deaths from poisonous animal bites are surprisingly low compared to India or some countries in Africa, because there, more often, people encounter with dangerous creatures, and at the same time, access to antidotes is much less than in Australia, and the level of medicine is lower. But for the theme of our today's video, it is interesting that due to the relatively early separation of the mainland from the rest and its isolation, Australia has become the home of many endemic species, unique plant and animal species, not found in other parts of the world, constantly interacting with each other and being part of the delicate balance of nature, which is so easy to break when humanity comes up with another great idea. It all started in 1787, when one of the Brazilian settlers decided to take his favorite cactus, a pontia, to his new homeland. To his joy, the plant liked the local climate. The cactus quickly took root, grew, and began to fructify. After a couple of years, his neighbors became interested in hats, and when he treated them with the jam from a pontia berries, they immediately asked the owner to give them cactus sprouts for planting on their land. Farmers really liked this low-maintenance plant, which could grow up to several meters in height, forming an almost insuperable hatch. They gladly planted it along the edges of fields with agricultural crops as a barbed fence against cows and sheep. They also began to breed cochineal and cacti, herbivorous bugs from which a valuable dye, natural carmine, was obtained. But massively planting cactus in all the best postures of the country, farmers did not take into account one little detail that this prickly pear did not have a single natural enemy on the new continent. So it began its triumphal march across Australia. Apoptia began to spread with the help of local wild animals who really liked its fruits. The droppings could contain up to a thousand of cactus seeds. Every year, a poncha spread along the usual migration routes of animals by an average of 2 kilometers. Since this plant was relatively fragile, even wind helped the rapid spread of the seeds. Branches broke off, and the wind did one's part, moving them further. Not to mention the terrible flood of 1893, which damaged many cacti and helped it spread to new areas. Therefore, a poncha multiplied so much that by 1900s, it occupied almost 4 million hectares of fertile land in the states of Queensland and continued to occupy about 400,000 hectares of new areas per year. At its peak, Apontia occupied an area equal to the size of the island of Great Britain, about 230,000 square kilometers. But the farmers sounded the alarm only when a true plague began among the cattle. They died in hundreds, thousands. The owners of the animals first blamed FMD, which was discovered about 30 years before the event described. But autopsies of dead animals forced farmers to change their minds. The stomachs of cows and sheep were literally pressed with apontia thorns. Cactus began to be seriously studied in order to protect farmers who are suffering huge losses. Zoologists and biologists literally clutched their hats. It turned out that most of the pastures turned into impassable bushes. Cacti grew up to 8 meters high and interlaced so that millions of hectares were completely crossed out of the farmland. And in 1893, Opuntia was declared a harmful exotic weed. While in 1901, the government appointed a generous reward of almost $750,000 of today's money for those who find justice for a carelessly imported newcomer. Six years later, the award was doubled, but there were no candidates for it. The most desperate farmers decided to fight the harmful thorn with wide and sharp knives. 
they cut down the cactus to the very root, but all these reminded of Don Quixote's fighting with windmills. In place of one felt hat, immediately grew two or three new ones. Having had enough of knives waving, the farmers very soon became convinced of the uselessness of this activity. They approached to the government to take tough measures against Apontia. Scientists sent letters of appeal around the world, including to the famous plant breeder Luther Bourbon, with a request to bring out a plant that would strangle Apuntia. Burbank replied that he once left a cactus hanging upside down on a tree for six years, and then he planted it and the cactus began to grow as if nothing had happened. Which means this plant can completely do without food and moisture, for a long time and even without roots. There was only one way left to poison the cactus, with pesticides. They were sprayed over the plantations of the enemy, but very quickly they became convinced that it was the Aponcha that suffered the least from poison. Animals, birds and plants died massively, and the cactus spread across Australia wider and deeper. It was then that the Commonwealth Prickly Pear Board was created, and there were bright minds who offered to go to South America and study the natural enemies of Prickly Pear on the spot. There they found out that the natural enemy of Aponcha was the Argentine cactus moth. More precisely, not the moth itself, but its gluttonous larvae as a stage of preceding development. And in 1925, 3,000 eggs of the cactus moth were brought to the continent, and a special agrobiological station was organized, where its population was increased, and a year later, the lovers were airdropped and fields overgrown with a poncho. History, unlikely, won't recall such a feast. The lovers had as much food as they cannot even dream of. A few months later, pilots flying over the prickly pear plantations found with satisfaction that small bald spots began to appear in the bright green carpet of cacti. But even with such massive eating of Aponcia, the active phase of the war lasted at least until 1937, during which the moth population greatly increased, but the nature then itself was able to fix the imbalance, and the moth population decreased following a reduction in the food source. At the end of this long war, grateful Australian farmers raised a special monument to the lovers that saved Australia. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again.